babies come and home. We are coming upon St. Luke's Episcopal Church right here on the left. Uh, the, the choir here was rather famous, and I guess my dad must have found out in short order where to take us to sing. The uh, choir director named um, William Ripley Dorr, he became our voice teacher. And uh, I remember he just really frowned upon the fact that we would sing pop music on occasion. At one time, we were doing some kind of radio shows, and uh, we were so afraid he'd find out about it, we changed our name to the Hudson Sisters instead of the Horn Sisters. <laughs> When I was about 18, a new friend was doing these recordings and they paid $40 a session or something like that, which was, you know, sounded awfully good. Because I've had this ability to mimic voices, I was able to take the big hits of the day, which is what those pirate companies did, be it K-Star, be it Peggy Lee, I would try to imitate their voices. A gypsy with a crystal ball to gaze in Because a guy is a guy wherever he may be So listen and I'll tell you what this man had it to me Be anything And those were put out in supermarkets um, for about 50 cents Nello stesso periodo la Horn incide anche dischi legali con il Roger Wagner Corel, che caratterizza con la sua peculiare sonorità la televisione americana dell'epoca e risveglia l'interesse verso la musica folk. Roger always wanted his women to sound like boy soprano. Light and airy. His Catholic training. <laughs> the ones I contracted would be about 12 of you women and about 24, 36 men. Exactly. You bet. Right. The old overtone <laughs> system. It was quite a lot of fun. No? Yeah. Great oh, experiences. Yeah. He's gone away for to stay a little while, but he's coming if he goes ten thousand miles, look away, look away over yonder We were doing the background music for what, it, uh, you know, we didn't even call them sitcoms then. I Married Joan by that wonderful American comedian, Joan Davis. And uh, instead of having an orchestra as the background music, they used a chorus. And it was Rogers people. Grazie al suo talento di imitatrice, la Horn presta la voce anche alle attrici, come in Carmen Jones di Hammerstein, un rifacimento della Carmen di Bizet. La protagonista è Dorothy Dandridge e il regista Otto Preminger. I knew Herschel Gilbert fairly well. He was the music director on, on, um, for Preminger on the film Carmen Jones, which was, was coming up. And uh, he was hiring singers and chorus and, and uh, so forth, and they didn't have anybody for... Um, Cindy Lou, which was not the Carmen part, but the, the, the ingenue role, so to speak, in the part of Carmen. 
And uh, I said, well, you have to listen to this friend of mine, Jackie Horn. I sang at that audition Michaela's aria in French and still didn't realize quite what was going on there. But I heard these, a lot of these women, young women uh, of all ages, sort of singing the famous Habanera, which I had never sung, but obviously knew in my ear and, and certainly could read that, uh, uh, in with the Hammerstein lyrics. Which in, in Carmen Jones is, Love's a baby that grows up wild. And she started imitating while well, she thought Dandridge would sing it or Carmen Jones would sing it. And he said, hey, that's terrific. We don't have a Carmen. And within a couple of days, I was cast to, to do that. And uh, I was 20 years old at the time. And it was just, um, I suppose, um, a lot of moxie that got me there and uh, the fact that I can imitate a lot of voices. Love's a baby that grows up wild And he don't do what you want him to Love ain't nobody's angel child And he won't pay any mind to you People say, boy, has your voice changed? Give him a cigarette I was a lighter voice, but I was trying to imitate her voice And all I got that man can get Taboo, but if you're hard to get a go for you, and if I do, then you are through, boy. My baby, that's the end of you. World War II sent an awful lot of refugees to the United States from the cultural world, from the musical world, especially. So our symphony orchestras, our music schools, and our Orchestras in the film studios were peppered and salted with all of these fabulous musicians. And this cultural life was really active there, and, and I became a part of it at, at a very young age, in my late teens. This is one of the houses where Stravinsky lived. We used to rehearse here, and I'm meeting my friend Grace Engel, who was one of the fellow singers. Oh, you remember uh, that? Mm-hmm. Here we are, young and innocente. With, with uh, the music of Stravinsky, one really had to count. Oh, yes. <laughs> not only did you count, not only did you learn to control the quality of your voice, but you did things with it you never thought you could do. Right, right. Like he would want things that were harsh yes. or biting. Do you remember? Mm, he, sure. he liked that in a voice. Right. Musically, for musicianship, nothing could have been a better teacher and more horrifying either, but right, I mean, it was right. frightening. Yes. I think that all of that, I always say, that went back here into this big tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And somehow mm -hmm. I, I pull things out all the time when I need them and I sort of don't, don't even know maybe where it came from, but some experience is back here that really has paid off in my later career. Stravinsky, che dedica la sua ultima opera alla Horn, le consiglia di andare in Europa per avanzare nella carriera operistica. Well, I spent um, three years in the Gelsenkirchen Municipal Opera in Germany. If one really wanted to be a singer of the leading roles, you had to, to go and experience what it was like to get through a leading role.